In that case, I would like to invite all speakers of the afternoon or, or speakers in general to unmute themselves and we'll have a, um, a, a second discussion uh, which involves monitoring for bees. Uh, Long-term monitoring. Oh, James, do you want to? Oh no, you've got band problems. Um, uh, it was put forward by James, so and it's a really I, important I, thing. Do you want to introduce it? Yeah, I do have band problems, but um, maybe I could give it a go and. Uh, if I drop out, just ignore me. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to do that. Can, can you hear me okay at the moment? Yeah. Okay. Um, I did actually try and organize my thoughts a little bit with a couple of slides just to kick off. So maybe I'll try and do that if that's okay. If you if you can stop yours, Katja. Oh, I can stop mine. Oh, my sharing. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, sharing. I... Yeah. Okay, I, I lost my Zoom thing, so this is now going to be very hard. Um, uh, oh dear. Ah. Now that... Ah, here. Okay, sorry. Yeah, good. Done. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see if this works. So uh, I expect, uh, so I've, I've certainly been involved in discussions about this topic a few times over um, several years, I think. And often I think uh, one of the main things that it focuses on is the, um, the taxonomic side of things. Can you see my slides yet? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I tried to summarize um, some of the issues and, and things here. Uh, so essentially uh, on, the, on the right hand side, we have like the really high quality data approach where every, um, I must admit, I was thinking more in terms of pollinators, not just bees, but I don't think it makes much difference actually. I think that that works fine. Um, so at the, at the one extreme, you, you can have a, like a, a a real bee taxonomist guru who can identify most things to species level, but that requires like detailed microscopy, um, maybe more than that. Um, at the very other extreme, you have some of the people who dip in briefly to some of the Facebook groups who kind of like bees, kind of interested. You know, maybe they can tell a fly from a bee, but not always. Um, they can recognize blue banded bees. Uh, and maybe stingless bees and sometimes honeybees. Um, and then in between, you've kind of got quite a few researchers who may be good ecologists and can do some of the insects, but not great on the ID level through to people who are, who are pretty good. Um, and this can be amateurs or, or professionals, but they're not quite in the, you know, they can't step up to the level of the, of the proper taxonomist. So I just think that We've got these two things and um, obviously the data you get at this end is great and high quality and so on and they're great, but at this end, it's perhaps too low to be useful. So maybe the best place is somewhere in the middle, um, but the problem with this end is it's got about three people in it um, and that's not likely to be changing um, very quickly. So I think it's it's quite interesting to, to think about what, what, are, what do you actually want to do and how do you get it to be um, both viable and sustainable? Uh, so I think the thing that I've heard less talk about is the study design. So clearly there's been a lot of stuff in the news, particularly about the insect apocalypse and so on. And it's always so much of the data is just not good long-term series of data. So you get patchy things with missing bits or lots of inconsistencies and then people point out just how the data really aren't very good. So I think to do this in a really in a decent way, it needs top-down organization at a regional or national level. Uh, it's, it's not going to be too difficult, so it's got to have built-in redundancy. Um, you've got to really be clear what you're trying to do. Are you trying to show, are you looking at abundance 
or biomass or species or particular groups? And there could be a series of questions. There's been an interesting paper recently just showing even in time series, um, because particularly because insect populations can be so variable year to year, even missing a few years can really make it hard to detect a decrease, for example. And then in terms of what actual surveys do you do? So most of the more citizen ended ones, including the Australian pollen account, seem to be timed flower counts and they're used in other countries too. But then when you get things designed by researchers, be more likely you adopt some fixed transects or sites, um, maybe trapping points. Um, and this would be, it's a different approach. Um, one thing that strikes me is you could have a, an easy and highly uh, resilient thing that could be done frequently, but also back it up with periodic blitzes when you really try and do the taxonomy better. Sorry, there's not much more of this. Stuff. Final thing, DNA. So actually, so one of my favorite lecture examples is, is the elephant in the room of cryptic species. So my, my first ever involvement in monitoring animals was large, large African mammals, which at the time included one elephant species. And now we have genetic data and there are two. Um, it's obviously a lot worse for, for insects. Uh, so Katya and Remco and others are working towards an Aussie B barcode reference library, which will be great. And there's already some there, but it's a much bigger job to be thinking about a, an insect one. It does still generally involve collecting and killing insects, although eDNA approaches can be used on flowers to some extent. And people are using museum specimens in non-destructive ways to get trace amounts of things like barcode sequences. So maybe there's more options there. So my thought to do this is to be really clear what the, what the key aims are, um, review the ways to generate the data, uh, look at what other countries have done, because Europe and North America in particular, people have been doing this for longer, um, and it's usually easier for them because they have fewer species and better taxonomy resources, but it's still hard to identify bees. Um, it needs an organizational team, it will need funding and personnel, and maybe this is something where the, the NSOC should be thinking to play a role, though I note that we already do have an organization, but it's a totally volu you know, voluntary effort of people at the moment. Um, so yeah, that's my 10 cents worth, and maybe some, throw it open to everybody else. <laughs> Good. Any? Responses? Um, I'll just chip in that there was a paper I think came out quite recently about um, using um, artificial intelligence to, to monitor videos and do both identification and counting of insects. Um, so that's one potential method. If you could set up a series of cameras that run continuously over, over multiple years, you could uh, use algorithms to, to generate some data from that. Um, you'd have to work out what to train it on in order to get that data. But um, that could be one way that uses technology and is pretty cost effective and um, very uh, low effort in terms of generating long term data. But not not specific to species, I suppose. Um, yeah, you're right. You just it's a much more uh, blunt method, but it, um, it would be at least um, low labor. I have noted that Turn is starting to become interested in um, in the uh, um, monitoring of invertebrates, and that I think would be one good thing to do, um, uh, because they go back to certain sites well every few years. But um, with pollinators, it is very much well. They're small sites, and is it flowering or not? Um, that is so variable that it gets really, really uh, difficult. Martin, could you? Yeah, so picking up one from Hoban and I in Canberra, being, well, I want to buy a couple of these light traps for identifying moths, and we're working out the costs, etc. But he still hasn't automated the process of recognizing moths in images. So um 
I want to buy them, but at the moment, all I'd be doing is collecting lots of photos. So I don't really know what to do with them. Um, moths, you know, things coming to a light sheet at night, very amenable compared to, you know, the insects coming to flowers. I just don't know how you'd actually, you know, get a camera to focus on that. I just, I think that's another level altogether. That'd be, you know, it's a, not a, it's a stationary, it's not, a, it's a moving target, it's small. It's irregular. I mean, yeah, that's, I reckon that's another lead, but I've talked to Donald. He's, he's the person. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Remco and I do some I, monitoring and that is using a vehicle net. So mm -hmm. we drive the same thing every month. Um, and uh, and uh, then we have a big sample. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was involved in a discussion, I think maybe something like eight or nine years ago, with when they were thinking of adopting invertebrate monitoring for the within the turn um, network, which would seem like one of the obvious place, places that it might get hosted. And the discussion was quite, it was, it was really interesting. There were quite a few people, I think it's about a dozen people involved. And, and what we came around to was, the difficulty in finding people, you know, if it was like 10 sites, finding people who could do the same kind of monitoring with enough expertise at each place. And we sort of came around to a couple, I think the strongest possibilities were like Martin said, moth, moths, but sticking with macro moths, um, where you can, where quite, it's maybe not too difficult, uh, it's still a big challenge, but, but you, you can really do quite a lot of species level ID and, um, some people can basically do pretty much all of them, uh, or actually ants using a like a really easy method that Alan Anderson had come up with. Um, uh, but that basically involved everybody else collecting the ants and then sending them to Alan and sorted them. Um, but that was a method that was never, by the nature of how it worked, it was not going to collect. You know, it's going to collect twenty species or twenty-five. It wasn't going to collect vast numbers of things. Um, and then that, so that was incorporated briefly, but then as thing with various, uh, iterations of funding for, for, no, for turn, it, it got, it got dropped about three years ago. Um, but that's the sort of network you would think would be a, a good way to do it. And I, yeah, I mean, I think the moths is actually quite a good idea. Yeah, it's very exciting. I just don't you know these things are collecting tons and tons of data and unless somebody can identify unless he automates the process of identifying it they're just going to sit there so terrible really useful but you know, same same issue we're having is so i've got some leftover money you know i want to buy about four or five of them who do i meet up with who do i give one to when do we set it off? You know, we all standardized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, macro. Oh, well, actually, the other thing I was just going to say is it's not just macro moths. The, the the images are so great. You know, we're seeing quite small moths, so it's really promising. It just it um, as um, Donald was telling me last week. Um, we need ex we need people to put in the time to train. The software to identify the, the moths in the photos and that's where he just doesn't have the time so he's built the equipment but you know we need someone to help do this automation of the identification of the species so yeah 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 anyone else ideas on how to approach this. It, it also requires money because you've got to do the same thing over a big country. And that, um, that, that, is, uh, that, that is really involved, I think, yeah. I popped this in the chat, um, but there's an ongoing effort in the US to build a research network monitoring bees in North America. Um, and anyone's welcome to join. That's probably a good idea to listen in or even talk to the organizers if you want to gain some insights because they're talking about these exact things 
But on top of that, I suspect, I mean, there's been a few meetings over the past few years about doing something like this, right? And they haven't really gone anywhere. And I suspect a big part of that is because there's not, as you said, a top-down organization, um, someone actually driving it forward. Yeah. So should the Australian Entomological Society do this, not just for pollinators, but for monitoring all insects? If you can pay someone to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we discussed these issues two years ago, but then two bouts of COVID lockdowns haven't, haven't really helped matters. But <clears throat> you're aware of that, Katja, and so is James Cook. So we're trying to do it for bees. Um, yeah, but recent events have not helped matters. No, that, that, that is a, a facility to identify them, but monitoring on a country, uh, on a, on a continent wide scale is, is something else again. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, We'll, we'll get there with the with the eDNA and all that kind of thing in the end, I'm sure. But uh, standardized monitoring and and uh, also monitoring of flowering plants and when they flower is, uh, is is really something. Yeah, and then visual monitoring or automated monitoring is only going to get you to a certain uh, level of taxonomic identification as well. So for you know for things like bees where. Things like halictine bees trying to discern different species from a from a photo or a video is almost impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, I think I think it does come down to um, to being very clear about what you what you really want. So, I, I think for many questions, I might be more interested in having a a well standardized and um, high quality data set of counts of things at the genus level than having as much as possible done at the species level and maybe doing blitzes from time to time to try and go to the species level. Um, I think if you set the bar, because it's so it's actually difficult, if we set the bar very high towards that species level thing, we're basically making it really hard to do anything. Um, the other thing I just, just a, that in general we, we lack in Australia, well, now globally, but uh, certainly in Australia as well, long term data sets of just doing the same thing in the same way for a long time with insect populations or communities more. Um, and actually, you know, another a sort of complementary approach is if, if people who are sort of well set up to you know, living in a place and they're going to be there for some time keep do, you know, do it take on a kind of study it could be different ta different insect tax are in different places but they produce kind of 10-year data sets which are really consistent um, and we have those for sometimes the same insects sometimes different insects those can also go towards show, you know showing longer term trends of course if they're on lots of different insects then it may, may allow generality about insects, but not about bees or grasshoppers or whatever it may be. Um, yeah. But I still think even, even the issue of insect ecologists studying one system in the same way for 10 years is pretty, pretty damn rare. One of the things, so you'd be aware that the Australian Plague Locust Commission is, is the best data set for three species of locust across the country that's been going since what, late 60s? The data never goes anywhere, but it's always been in the back of my mind. But one of the things I've learned since coming to Victoria is the incredible um, expertise and quite regular sampling by amateur entomologists light sheeping at night. And they're always, you know, getting photos of rare things. They never, I've been talking to them a bit about actually getting ecological data, you know, can you go and set these light sheets up at a set time, at a set, you know, in a set area, can you get the density and abundance? And I never managed to get much movement there, but there are a group of people out there who do this all the time. They're experts, you know, I know people in Tasmania too, they can photo off a light sheet, 
bang, they can identify it. We need some way, and I reckon this would be where the society probably could offer them something, um, some sort of recognition and network for them to upload stuff to. I mean, it's just sitting there. It's just amazing. And they, you know, they talk about it at NSOC meetings here in Melbourne, but they never actually, you know, do anything more with it. And I don't think anyone else is aware of how useful the data is and what, you know, how they should be being supported if we could. So I know it's not relevant to bees, but I'm just stunned and can't and want to try and shift them from amateurs to quasi quasi yeah. politics, you know getting actual data that starts to feed into these silly you know apocalypse debate type scenarios just getting trends you know over time but they need some somewhere being guided some way of recognizing the value of it but yeah i haven't worked out how to do it so atlas of living australia or iNaturalist, are they suitable? They upload to there, but it's not that's that's not the ecology side of it that I'm sort of keen for them to try and get. You know, I say to them, can you try and do it at set moon phases? Can you try and record, you know, temperature, etc.? Can you do a set area of the light sheet? You know, <laughs> they're all they just it's not within their remit. You know, they're not doing it for that reason. They're just doing it to go, oh, I saw a such and such in this location. That's really interesting. You know, end of story. And that's the pity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's it's true, but they're not scientifically trained often. So it's hard well, to I've get that. My up to help them get there, but it's just not yeah. that sort of interest. I, I just they don't see it like that. So somehow you need to identify some people who want to do that and perhaps support them somehow yeah to to go back to uh, what james said i think that comparing us with what's happening in the northern hemisphere is um very tricky because we have got a, a very different ecology if my focal eucalypt species flowers every seven years i basically have nothing in 10 years time. Um, this is very much what's happening. So in, in, uh, to explain this, I'm from the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, you will find the same bee species in the same spot every year, right? This is not the case in Australia. Um, so that makes it much, much more difficult to get a good database. Let me see, there's some people in the chat. Sandra says various field naturalist groups have people willing to collect data or to study, but they could need a good simple methodology. And James says, do you think that the state government organizations should get, could get involved in that? Um, organized under someone from the Australian Entomological Society. Um, he doesn't know whether they have funding which they don't, uh, but uh, at least they are longer at one place, which is absolutely true because we are in a three, three and a half year cycle often. Um, anybody else has a contribution to this? Just a th yeah, just another thought based on what people have been saying in the last few comments. I think, I think the difficulty is to set up is to be able to set something up that's a worthwhile and b it's not just going to run for two or three years and then kind of dissolve away. And I think you know ideas like um, capturing a pre-existing um, enthusiast network who are actually quite good at identifying stuff it is probably in some ways more viable than trying to set something up where you then have to train everybody as well um, so it sounds like you know potentially with some at least in some geographic areas with uh, moth enthusiasts you may have people who who are good enough at identifying things to make it really useful but um, 
yeah, are basically just doing it for fun at the moment. So yeah, maybe actually targeting, basically bringing those people into a scientific method framework might be a, a more feasible way of doing something and not necessarily need a lot of money because you it would be like a setup and then more or less run itself. So just have someone who's really managing and analyzing data. Um, maybe that's that's a more viable scheme. I mean, I think the difficulty was, you know, it's very clear from social media that there's great enthusiasm and interest in, in native bees, but like, you know, half of the posts I see have a hoverfly and say, what kind of native bee is this? So, you know, it's really not a starter with a lot of people, but I think if you have, if you have a more taxonom taxonomically learned uh, user group, which may be the case with, with some of these light cheating people, then that might, that might be a better target in some ways. The other thing, although I'm not very good at it. <laughs> They'd only be set periods of time. You didn't ask them to do it. But one of the problems why the Fame Tag Locust Commission's long term light trapping is so expensive is that they ask people to be emptying out the light traps daily for up to, depending on how far north they are, eight months of the year. That's just too much effort, you know. So you'd ask these people to do set periods of time, set location, um, compile the data, and then, you know, every year perhaps get them to a some sort of central conference or something where they can present their data and they get something out of it and they see the bigger picture from it. They're always working in isolation. They probably don't see where it all fits in. So I'm sure it could be done pretty cheaply and it just need, but it just needs active organization and you know, yeah, driving that way. I'm, I'm sure it's doable. I, I know a, a guy who's got a fantastic blog down in, um, uh, southern, uh, southern south, south coast of New South Wales. So we've got beautiful pictures and of uh, bees, etc. Coming, well, I've forgotten what it's called, bush blog or something like that. He would be. I think. I, yeah, I think I've seen the same one. Yeah, yeah. it's very good. Southern yeah, southern forests. If, you know, yeah, and he'd be one of the people you try and sign up. And yeah, it's doable. It's just need someone to just whose job it is to just drive it and produce a sort of a framework for them to all work in and yeah it's doable yeah well we can take it to the aes as an idea and uh, and uh, to start coordinating or tapping into these to these groups more um that uh, might it might it will it will be good for the for, for the society i would think to, to actually do that, it will ground them more in 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 the community, um, and uh, also with the active um, uh, state societies, because the Victorians are quite active, and Queensland is of course um, a powerhouse when it comes to uh, insect activity, and quite possibly we could we could um, get something like that off the ground. Okay, any other contributions? No, in that case, um, I think I would, I would like to thank all the speakers for their contributions today and their active participation in discussions. And I would, um, if you're a student, please attend the uh, student event. It will start at at, um, let me see, at five, so um, directly after this meeting, and it's on this line, so uh, you can you can just stay here, and um, and thank you all for uh, for joining in. See you tomorrow.